is the story of Liberia, Africa's only republic. It is a story of many chapters and moods, a story of people and the land that sustains them. It is also a story of American enterprise in the lush tropical jungles of West Africa. The story of Liberia is first a story of land, a segment of land framed by the immensity of the Earth's second largest continent. In 1822, a group of free American Negroes set out to colonize this land. It was not easy. In 1847, after a quarter century of struggle, sacrifice, and hardship, these colonizers and their children founded a new nation for free men. Its name, Liberia, means liberty. It did not take the colonizers long to discover that the land which they had chosen to settle was abundantly fertile. Plentiful sunlight and rainfall combined to create a climate that encourages growth. Food crops, timber, fibers, luscious fruits and dense tropical vegetation. Another testament to the rich soil is the abundant floral growth. Bougainvillea. African moonflower. Poinsettias, hibiscus, and a host of others. The story of Liberia is also a story of people, including 23 long-established tribes. Most of Liberia's tribes people live in villages which are centers of community-owned farms. Self-sufficiency remains the keynote of tribal living, which is a way of life as well as a means of livelihood. Seeds like this housewife pounding and winnowing rice are everyday occurrences. Rice is the basic grain of the Liberian diet. Most Liberians are farmers. Their pattern of living is shaped by the land. These farmers are planting cassava, whose starchy roots are to Liberians what potatoes are to us. The African oil palm, one of the most important crops in the world today, supplies fats and gravy for the native diet and provides a valuable export. Fish are a delicacy. They abound in the coastal waters, and the tribal fishermen who catch them enjoy considerable prestige. Saining or trapping in freshwater pools for smaller fish and minnows is woman's work. Handicrafts such as weaving and mat making are done almost entirely by men. The cloth they weave has a wide variety of uses and is an important item of barter. Mat makers find the jungle an inexhaustible source of raffia and other fibers. A tribesman of outstanding importance is the blacksmith, whose portable anvil and goatskin bellows can be carried from village to village. A highly necessary application of native skills is house building. This is a community project with many villagers lending a hand. The materials for these circular huts, small logs, vines, mud thatch, are plentiful. The single all-purpose building tool is the cutlass. With the family and neighbors helping, these houses can be built in a single day at a cost of as little as five dollars. And now this house built in a day becomes a home. Carrying their possessions with them, the family moves in. And moving is very simple. You just walk in, put your belongings down, come out, act natural, and immediately feel very much at home. Community living, working and living together, comes quite naturally to Liberian tribes people, whose traditional tribal palaver is the African equivalent of the American town meeting or public hearing. Strong young men are first-hand bearers of gifts and friendly commerce. Here, tribes people have long realized that little can be accomplished unless one is able to get along with his neighbors and to share their problems and interests. This elemental spirit of democracy is colorfully in evidence at the native market, 
where daily many of the tribe's people gather to gossip, exchange news, and sell the products of their farms, looms, and workbenches. An attractive array of African peppers. The fruit of the African oil palm. Liberian citrus and sugar cane. Dried minnows. And carved ivory. And a golden leopard pelt. Displays at the native market are skillfully arranged to present such typical native products as country cloth, home woven of wool or cotton, and used for clothing, bedding, and draperies. Next door to this market is the U.S. Trading Company, operated by Firestone to supply American-made products and brands at prices well below United States averages. Liberia is a land of contrast. Only a few miles from the native market is a scene as modern as tomorrow. A mighty airliner is landing at Roberts Field. Built by Firestone during World War II, this is one of the largest, most strategic land plane bases in the world. It is within 30 flight hours of New York. The energy of the age-old Farmington River has been harnessed to provide the power needed for Firestone's widespread industrial operations in Liberia. Modern homes on Firestone plantations. With a change of foliage, these might be seen in the better suburbs of any American city. The base hospital, which serves one area of the far-spreading plantations. This modern clinic would do credit to any community. Almost within earshot of messages being sent by jungle drums, are these Firestone radio towers beamed for North America. This Firestone golf course is enjoyed alike by the plantation staff and travelers and servicemen. But recreation must consider all tastes. Native rugby teams play a spirited game on a plantation's play field. In workers' villages on the plantations, native music, games, and dances hold sway. A Liberian stilt dance. This is one of the more interesting of the acrobatic dances inherent to a great continent that is peopled with great dancers. Rhythm, balance, and poise are superbly proved. This traditional warrior's dance is another of Liberia's ever colorful folk arts. It is an arduous recreation dedicated to the enjoyment of all, regardless of ages or skills. And it is as African as Africa itself. Here, as elsewhere, good recreation is companion to good work. Liberian workers in many fields are convincing proof of how far the nation has advanced. The basic reason for Liberia's advancement is a milky liquid called latex, the initial harvest of natural rubber. By means of this white liquid, Liberia has achieved a significant place in world commerce. The story of rubber in Liberia begins with the clearing of thousands of acres of tall forests and dense jungles. To fell these giant trees requires an army of men with axes. The jungle's cry of surrender is the deep-throated rumbling of big trees crashing to earth. By the thousands, the forest giants fall so that space may be provided for valuable and orderly forests of rubber trees. Elsewhere, men with strong arms and sharp cutlasses are forcing the dense, wiry, matted undergrowth to give up its long hold on the land. operation is both vast and noisy. The work is paced by the beat of native drums. Clearing is completed during the dry season when the fell jungle growth is burned. Often thousands of acres are cleared by a single fire.
Armed with long bamboo torches, workmen set the fire systematically. Without careful planning and great caution, the fire could become a serious menace to life and property. Yet through the years, there have been almost no accidents. Impressive testimony to the know-how of these men. Smoke in the tropic sky comes to mean more land being made ready for more rubber. The seeds of rubber trees are planted in nurseries to provide stock for later transplanting to clear areas. There is one nursery for each rubber growing division. Within a few months, the seeds become young trees. In the nurseries, the seedlings are changed to high yielding rubber trees by means of a scientific process called bud grafting. This means grafting the living bud of a high yielding strain of rubber onto the root system of a hardy seedling. Successful bud grafting requires outstanding manual skill. First, a window or opening is cut in the bark of the seedling. Then a living bud is cut from a tree that is known to be a high producer of latex. The bud is trimmed with considerable care, then placed into the window. Then it is bound securely. The wound is taped and sealed with wax as a double protection against weather and insects. Several weeks later, after it has been determined that the bud graft is successful, the seedling top is cut away. In time, grafted shoot from the new bud becomes the trunk and top of a superior rubber tree that grows from healthy roots. In the newly cleared areas, workers are busy lining and holing. Aligning the rows and digging the holes that will anchor the young trees in permanent and symmetrical groves. A Liberian technician uses a transit to make certain that the rows are straight and evenly spaced. The tree locations are carefully measured and marked with stakes. Most of the soil is a rich red clay loam or laterite. It is deep and fertile. The entire operation is geared to exacting standards. Even so simple a task as digging a hole is governed by predetermined measurements. Next, the holes are refilled with rich humus topsoil. Then a deep hole is punched into the loose earth. Then the bud grafted rubber tree, after being severely pruned, is transplanted from the nursery and painstakingly anchored with all the care exercised by an experienced orchardist in planting a young fruit tree. In rich earth, under equatorial rains and sun, they grow rapidly. This one is 15 months old, these two years old, and these three years. After five or six years, the Liberian rubber tree is sufficiently mature to be tapped. The first tapping cut is measured carefully. Opening the tapping panel requires a sharp knife and a trained and steady hand. And there begins to ooze forth the first drops of the hundreds of gallons of latex that the tree will produce during its long life. Rubber tapping begins with the day itself. First dawn at the villages that dot the plantations sees long lines of tappers setting forth. Liberia's millions of rubber trees 
now require the services of more than 30,000 workers. All these men are tribe members and all are Liberians. On a large rubber plantation, the tapper is the aristocrat among all the workmen. Each man has had individual instruction and has served apprentice training in this exacting craft. For rubber tapping demands pre-surgery of a high degree of skill. Thus, a tapper takes real pride in his work. Each tapper is assigned to about 250 trees and is equipped with a specially designed tapping knife, two latex buckets that hold a total of 12 gallons, and a bottle of chemical, which delays the coagulation of the latex. First, the tapper removes the thin string of latex, which has coagulated from a previous morning's tapping. He cuts with precise care, since the latex oozes from cells located between the outer and inner. When the first panel is exhausted, cutting begins at the top of the second. That finished, the bark on the first panel has renewed itself. A dash of anticoagulant and on to the next tree. The desperate need for rubber during World War II prompted Firestone to introduce the harvest routine to increase the yield of a single tree. The usual one-level tapping was supplemented by a second tapping at a higher level. This intensive harvest, called high panel tapping, produced thousands of tons of rubber, which were of life or death importance to our fighting forces. High panel tapping made shock troops of millions of Liberian rubber trees. That gong means that it is time to collect the latex. Tapping is done in the early hours because the late morning heat slows the flow of latex. Roughly one third of the weight of the latex that flows from the tree will be dry rubber. Rubber is in these buckets, thousands of pounds of rubber in these thousands of gallons of milky latex. Latex is an unstable compound. From now on, men, chemistry, and bacteriology will be fighting for time to convert this valuable white liquid into useful rubber. The pace is slower now. The buckets are heavy with the liquid harvest. The latex is collected at a division station. Each station serves many hundreds of tappers. On the Firestone plantations in Liberia, there are dozens of these stations. Inside the division station, the crop of each tapper is weighed, recorded, and poured into a receiving tank. Each station receives several thousand gallons of latex every day. From the division latex station, the latex is hauled in 1,800-gallon tank trucks to the central processing factory, and there is emptied into a receiving tank. At the Firestone Processing Factory at Harville, the largest of its kind in the world, the fresh latex is converted into several commercial grades of rubber. The cream of the latex crop goes into centrifuges that work like cream separators. After centrifuging, the concentrated latex is shipped in bulk or in drums for making Fomex latex mattresses elastic thread, surgical goods, and other valuable and specialized items. Other latex is processed as dry rubber. The addition of an acid helps it to coagulate in big vats. When partly solidified, the blubber, as it is called at this stage, its appearance is similar to that of clabbered milk, is chopped into big slices.
hunks of blubber are sent down chutes to a line of power-operated mangles and washers. The rollers squeeze out most of the water content and shape the rubber into white pads. These pads presently become sheets of rubber and are hung up to dry in enclosed rooms where the temperature is precisely controlled. After drying, the rubber is squeezed by hydraulic presses into solid, bouncy bales, each weighing 224 pounds or 10 bales to the long ton. The baled rubber is loaded aboard lighters, which carry it down Liberia's Farmington River to the Atlantic. The cargoes originate at a river pier near the inland processing factory. The heavily laden lighters travel down river into an ocean front cluttered with sandbars. To span over these, the lighters are built to have shallow drafts. Their destination is a freighter anchored a short way out at sea. Here the rubber leaves its birthplace and begins a journey to a world that depends on it to do a thousand vital jobs in a million places. The fact that a rubber production enterprise of international importance exists in Liberia today is the result of the vision and courage of a prominent American who in the early 1920s became convinced that Americans should produce their own rubber. This in order to assure supplies of this vital material and to safeguard American consumers from the tyrannies of alien rubber cartels. This industrial pioneer was Harvey S. Firestone, the founder of the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, a worldwide organization which required ever-increasing quantities of rubber. A worldwide survey of rubber-producing areas was actively directed by Harvey S. Firestone, Jr., who, after a study of many tropical lands, selected Liberia for the Firestone rubber plantations. Under his direction, the Firestone Plantations Company has changed what was a massive jungle to some 75,000 acres of orderly plantations. The caliber of industrial statesmanship which has developed the Firestone organization presupposes a never-ending improvement of product. Research is paramount at Firestone, whose watchword is best today, still better tomorrow. At the plantation's laboratory, Americans and Liberians work together to contribute in many ways to general scientific knowledge. The byproducts of rubber in terms of human and social values are of tremendous importance, since so many of the resources of Liberia do not yield economic returns, yet are of great and lasting human values. Schools, churches, and hospitals are among these resources. It has always been the desire of Firestone to contribute to the social and human, as well as the economic progress of Liberia. This is one of several free schools on the Firestone plantations supported by Firestone and supervised by the Liberian government. These schools are for the free use of children of employees. Maintaining a high standard of health and sanitation in the tropics requires a large and varied medical staff. Here, native medical technicians perform mass vaccination against smallpox. Here is the preliminary examination for African sleeping sickness. Local clinics supplement the service of the field medical personnel. All serious cases are attended at a central base hospital, which is at par with a well-qualified and well-equipped hospital in any medium-sized American city. Firestone's comprehensive program for health and sanitation in Liberia employs American physicians and surgeons who are ably assisted by native nurses and technicians. Needs for modern surgery as well as for immunization and other medical services, both preventive and curative, are ever urgent and ever varied. Native technicians and nurses trained by the American medical staff serve devotedly and well. Opportunities for beneficial research are among the greatest anywhere. The advantages in research, like the many other widely beneficial resources of Liberia, are enhanced by the sincere democracy at work, which is one of the foremost resources of this or any other nation.
The close bond of democracy that exists between Liberia and the United States is exemplified by the capital city, Monrovia, which was named for James Monroe, an American president. The motto of Liberia's early settlers, the love of liberty brought us here, still has living meaning. Monrovia is dotted with government buildings which offer tangible evidence of the nation's interest in education, culture, and democratic government. Among them is the legation of the United States. This is Liberia's legislative hall, where the nation's lawmakers meet. Here they are assembled to hear an address by President William B.S. Tubman, who delivers his State of the Nation address to a newly convened legislature. By constitution and tradition, the government of Liberia is similar to the government of the United States. This impressive harbor was completed in 1947, one century after the founding of the Republic. It marks Monrovia as one of the important ports of Africa. This, then, is the story of Liberia, an heroic story of resources and progress, of a nation founded by free men, a nation that stands as a beacon light of freedom on the fringe of what was once called the Dark Continent. The story of Liberia is without beginning and without end, for here the past and the present are but steps to the inspirational promise of the future. Thank you.